In his remarks today, um, Dr. Esselie plans to focus on the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and the University of Chicago, uh, saying less about his far-reaching philanthropic endeavors, which range from just the other side of the metro tracks with the Museum of Science and Industry to agricultural settlements in Russia, and perhaps most famously, the Rosenwald schools, which provided education to blacks throughout the American South. But before I turn the floor over to him and we turn back to the University of Chicago, I wanted to underscore the importance of these philanthropic endeavors, not simply as episodes in the history of American philanthropy, but also as exceptionally important examples of how private initiatives produce public goods. In his classic study, The Great Transformation, Carl Polanyi credited this kind of social rather than technical innovation with the Industrial Revolution, saw it as a great source for social change and social improvement, and despaired of the fact that once the market model became ascendant as the main way of organizing economic life, uh, what happened was, in Polanyi's word, that the genius for social artifacts became um, homeless. Rosenwald's accomplishments, however, reject that despair, and I think demonstrate um, how it's possible to find new ways of organizing business, organizing philanthropy, and importantly, new ways of linking business, philanthropy, and government in a way that really does provide capacity for social improvement and perhaps for social transformation. And I would say that in the current moment, we have much to learn from this particular piece of history. So I truly welcome Peter Askeley to tell us something about Julius Rosenwald and his contribution to this great social artifact, the University of Chicago. So welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you all very much for coming. The association with Julius Rosenwald and the University of Chicago was long and goes pretty far back. Some of you may have seen the picture of a friendly looking Jewish gentleman in Hutchinson Commons and wondered who this man was. Uh, many of you have certainly heard of Rosenwald Hall, but perhaps weren't sure who was the person after whom it was named. And so I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, Julius Rosenwald and particularly about his association with the University of Chicago. The other association is that all of his children went to the lab school. Um, Rosenwald was born in 1862 in Springfield, Illinois. His father, his, both of his parents were German Jewish immigrants. His father arrived in Baltimore in 1850 with $20 in his pocket and started the typical immigrant experience. He became a peddler and then he got hooked up with a family in Baltimore that was, uh, had a bunch of stores and specialized in making clothing. And he had the good fortune to marry the boss's sister. And his wedding present was a store in Peoria, Illinois. And for a while, they led a sort of peripatetic life and ended up in Springfield in 1860 in a store that was selling uniforms to the Union troops and doing a land office business. And it was there in 1862 in a house very close to that where Abraham Lincoln had lived that Julius Rosenwald was born. His youth was completely unexceptional, except that he never finished high school and he never went to college, a fact which bothered him all his life, as you will shortly see. Uh, instead of finishing high school, he went to New York and started in his mother's family's business because the family had moved from Baltimore to New York and had become fantastically wealthy. And so Rosenwald started at the bottom and started working his way up. And after being there a few years, in 1885, he decided with a brother and a cousin to move to Chicago and open a store that specialized in making lightweight summer men's suits, a niche market if there ever was one. And he did that for a while, and then he shifted and uh, got involved in making very inexpensive men's clothing. And in 1895, he ended up buying one quarter of Sears Roebuck, 
uh, a firm which had recently moved from Minneapolis to Chicago, a mail order firm. It remained mail order until the 1920s. And he purchased one quarter of Sears Roebuck for $37,500, which turned out to be a rather good investment <laughs> because by 1900, Sears Roebuck had outstripped its rival Montgomery Ward and was doing $10 million worth of sales. Rosenwald became the president of Sears in 1908, and I'm really not going to talk much about his business life, although I'd be happy to answer questions about it. I'd just like to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, he brought order and system to this company, which was not very well organized, and he created a, he and others created a system whereby when an order was received uh, in the mail, it was turned around and sent out within 24 hours. In order to do that, he had to build this huge plant on the west side of Chicago on Holman Avenue, some of which is still in existence there. And, and he was successful in doing that. He also really felt strongly about his workers. Uh, there's a famous story that uh, was printed by, in Forbes magazine, by, uh, written by the grandfather of the current Forbes, who kind of thought he had discovered Rosenwald. And the story is that one day, Rosenwald and a friend were leaving the Sears Roebuck plant, and people were streaming out. It employed thousands of people. And the friend turned to Rosenwald and said, Mr. Rosenwald, how does it feel to have all these people working for you? And Rosenwald replied, they don't work for me. They work with me. And this made headlines, because this was not the way the CEO of what was by that time the largest retailer in the world was supposed to talk. And indeed, he ran the company more by committee of top people than a top-down organization. Uh, it was a group of trusted advisors who ran Sears, and Rosenwald was the one who was responsible. Um, I'm not going to, as I say, I really don't want to say much more about his relationship with Sears, um, and you can ask questions about this, except to say that because of Sears, Rosenwald became a fantastically wealthy man. By 1929, his fortune was estimated to be $200 million, which in today's terms would make him certainly a billionaire, and in terms of now there are a lot of billionaires, but in those days he would have been something the, somewhat the equivalent of a Bill Gates. In any case, he, like others of his era, Rockefeller and Carnegie, turned to philanthropy and uh, fairly early on, earlier than Carnegie and Rockefeller, I think, uh, in some respects. And the inspiration for his philanthropy, he claimed it was his mother. But in actual fact, it seems fairly clear that it was his rabbi, Emil G. Hirsch, who was the rabbi of Chicago's Sinai congregation and who was a real social reformer. It was Hirsch who believed that it was incumbent upon the wealthy members of his congregation not merely to give tzedakah to charity, but to give to, to social justice. Um, he, he really believed that uh, and there's a Jewish phrase, tikkun olam, remaking the world, and Rosenwald bought into this idea completely. And so it was really Rabbi Hirsch who started turning him on to philanthropy. And at first his philanthropy was mostly to Jewish causes, and then later on he became involved in a whole realm of different things, some of which I'll discuss, including Hull House uh, he, and Jane Addams and, uh, and the University of Chicago. His first connection with the University of Chicago occurred in 1904 when I think it was probably Rabbi Hirsch who persuaded him to buy a German library which was for sale uh, for the German department. And so he contributed $4,782 for the purchase of this library. After that, he, he remained in touch with the university and around 1908, he was put on the board of Rush Medical Center, which at that time was actually, since there was no hospital here, that was the hospital that was connected to the University of Chicago. And he, he did a few other things. He created a scholarship for um, or an oratorical contest. But in 19, 
1911, um, there were moves afoot to get him to join the board of the university. And this was not an easy thing because the university was a Baptist uh, university. It was founded by Baptists originally. And there was a clause in the Articles of uh, Incorporation that there had to be only, there could only be a certain number of non-Baptists on the board, and there was already one Jew. And so there was a really serious, and this man showed no interest in leaving the board. And so there was a real question of whether Rosenwald would, would be accepted. So he was asked to join by a gentleman named Judge Baldwin. They were sitting at dinner one night, and Baldwin uh, asked him if he was interested in joining the board of the university. And Rosenwald's reply was, I, I don't think I can really do that because I never finished high school and I never went to college. And Baldwin's reply to that was, sir, you are therefore insulting me because I also never finished high school and never went to college. <laughs> so Rosenwald said, well, I'll have to ask my wife, which is also interesting in itself. And evidently, his wife, Gussie, agreed to this. And so in 1911, he joined the board of the University of Chicago. In 1912, Rosenwald turned 50. And although he was a relatively modest man, he decided to give away $687,500 with great fanfare because he wanted to prove a point. And the point was he was already opposed to endowments, and he felt that people who had wealth should give the money away while they were alive. In fact, a friend of his who was a public relations man, a journalist, came up with the wonderful expression, which he thought was fine, give while you live. And so <laughs> that was what was partly behind this $687,500, which was given to a whole variety of different causes. But 250000 of it was given to the University of Chicago and it was given to build a building, but it wasn't clear which building was going to be built. And so Rosenwald left it up to the trustees. There were three possible choices. One was a women's gymnasium, an athletic center, which of course ultimately became Ida Noyes. The other was a classics building. And the third was a building for the Department of Geography and Geology. And so uh, this was the thing that uh, the trustees of the university decided that they really wanted the money for, which was the Department of Geology and Geography. And um, so when two-thirds of, it was a sort of matching grant, uh, Rosenwald contributed two-thirds of the money to build the building, and when that was in, he gave his share, and so Rosenwald Hall became a reality. It's interesting that it was named Rosenwald Hall because Rosenwald didn't like to have buildings named after him as uh, I may tell you later with regard to the Museum of Science and Industry. And the trustees sort of snuck this past him. He was on a trip to Egypt. And this was at that, it was at that moment that the Board of Trustees decided they would call it Rosenwald Hall. And by the, time, by the time he came back from the Middle East, there was really nothing he could do about it. So he sort of had to accept it with good grace. Then the next, he continued on as a trustee, and the next really big thing that he did was in, regarding the medical school. In 1916, um, a friend of his, recent friend of his, who was connected to the Rockefellers, named Abraham Flexner, um, d was uh, talking to President Hen Harry Pratt Judson and decided that uh, what the, the two of them decided that what the university really needed was a medical school which would be like the Harvard of the Midwest, or the, actually the Johns Hopkins of the Midwest. Flexner had just done a study of American medical schools which indicated that for the most part they were really terrible compared to those of Europe. And so there was a really compelling need for this. And, but they needed to get somebody who would make a lead gift that was significant. So Flexner came to Chicago and he made an appointment with Rosenwald to have lunch in the Sears dining room. And they sat down and there was another uh, one of, of Rosenwald's uh, colleagues who was there and he said that he wasn't feeling well. 
And um, so after the lunch, uh, Flexner and Rosenwald went to Rosenwald's office, and uh, Flexner said, uh, brought this up and used it as a sort of hook to try to get uh, Rosenwald, who, by the way, I called JR in the book, because that's what his friends called him, so that's what I'm going to call him. It's easier and shorter than saying Rosenwald. So he said um, that this, you know, what, what was needed was a really first rate uh, medical school and was, was, would Rosenwald be interested? So Rosenwald's response was, come to dinner at my country home in uh, Highland Park and talk to my wife about it. So Flexner did this and JR was really interested and it wasn't immediate. There were all kinds of negotiations. Uh, there, he had to go out and visit a, a medical school at, uh, Saint, in Saint, at Washington University in St. Louis. But finally, he agreed to give $500,000 towards the building of the medical school. And this was one of the first large gifts that was received. Um, it took another decade before uh, the medical, Billings Hospital and the medical school opened, but at least the, the ball had been started rolling. And in fact, he was so enthusiastic that he also started soliciting friends to also get money for the med school. Because as you'll see, he not only liked to give money himself, he liked to get others to give it too. Um, then in uh, the next big thing was SSA. And some of you may be graduates of SSA and are here for the hundredth, for the centennial of SSA. I happen to think they may be a year off and that actually SSA really should count its anniversary as 2020, but I guess maybe 2009 is okay. But let me tell you a little bit about this. The SSA really started under a man named Graham Taylor, who uh, was on the faculty here. He taught sociology, and he also created a uh, settlement house, somewhat similar to Hull House, called the Chicago Commons. And he taught, he started under President Harper, teaching a class here on civics and philanthropy. And Harper thought that was great. But when Harper died, the university decided they didn't want this around anymore. And so Graham Taylor went off and founded a school of civics and philanthropy. And in what I think was 1908, but perhaps was really 1909, they got a board of directors which Rosenwald was on, and Jane Addams was on, and the usual suspects, really. Uh, Judge Mack, who was uh, uh, one of the founders of the juvenile court, which the first juvenile court in the country, which started here in 1900. And so all of these people were on the board of the School of Civics and Philanthropy. The School of Civics and Philanthropy sort of limped along year after year. It was chronically short of money. I don't think Graham Taylor knew how to manage it. And Rosenwald gave, gave to it every year. And finally, by about 1917, he was getting sick of it. And so they tried to figure out what to do with this institution, which they didn't want to have killed. And so in, people started asking around. There were overtures made to Northwestern. They weren't interested. There were overtures made to the University of Chicago. Initially, they weren't interested. And finally, in 19... 19 and 1920, uh, all of this began to bear fruit. Rosenwald was on the board of both the School of Civics and Philanthropy and the University of Chicago, and I believe that he played an absolutely pivotal role behind the scenes in bringing these two institutions together and creating SSA. At a meeting of the Board of Trustees in um, Let's see, in uh, 19, August 5, 1920, uh, Graham Taylor and Sophonispa Breckenridge, who was one of the women pioneers uh, of the School of Civics and Philanthropy, presented their proposal to the Board of Trustees. The board initially was not terribly enthusiastic, uh, but a group of trustees, including Rosenwald, agreed to contribute $25,000 a year for five years, and Rosenwald agreed to put in $5,000 of this sum so that there would be uh, a nice cushion. And he agreed that if somebody didn't pay up, he would make up the difference. And 
So this sweetened the pot a little bit, and the university accepted this, and therefore SSA was born. But this, the transition was not altogether smooth, because SSA was actually under the dean of the School of Commerce, which was beca later became the business school, and this man was absolutely uninterested in social work, and sort of felt that the whole thing should probably die. And so, several years after the initial, uh, after 1920, in 1923, in December of 23, J.R. received a letter from a friend of his at the law school named Freund, who was very much interested in SSA, who said, look, things are not going well here. This dean is not doing the school any favors. The people are demoralized. In fact, the school was doing very well. It was raking, bringing in many more students than they thought. And you need to try, if, see if what you can do to influence the administration to change the, uh, to, to get someone else as dean. So Rosenwald immediately marched over to Harry Pratt Judson's office, told him the story. The next thing that happened was that Edith Abbott became the dean of SSA. Rosenwald continued his interest in SSA. Um, he, in 1928, he was on the board of a, uh, he, he was one of three people who had been named to get rid of an estate of a man who had discovered the flashlight battery. And who, I mean, really, all kinds of random. The other people on this board were former Governor Al Smith of New York and former President Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> and these, th there was a $6 million estate that had to be given away. And so the three of them decided how the money should be divvied up. So Rosenwald, of course, wanted to, every, it turned out that instead of thinking seriously about how to give away this money, uh, it ended up going to the special interests of each, in, each person. Well, Rosenwald was interested in SSA, and so it got $250,000 from the estate of Conrad Hubert. Uh, by 1929, he was still giving $10,000 a year for general operating support and $5,000 to, for the publication of two textbooks by Sophonis of Breckenridge and Edith Abbott. So he continued his interest in SSA. He also got involved in the Oriental Institute, but I'm not going to get involved in that. In 1924, the University of Chicago engaged in a capital campaign, one of the earlier ones to, to take place. And of course, JR was solicited. And he agreed to give a million dollars to the capital campaign. But there were strings attached to it. Remember that he didn't believe in endowments. So this money was supposed to go into a fund, which was called a suspense account. And a certain amount of it had to be spent every year. In other words, it had to ultimately go out of existence. And so um, he added another million later on. and. So there were two million that could be used, and I don't know, something like $80,000 per year had to be spent. But it could be spent on absolutely anything that the trustees wanted. It could be used for faculty salaries, it could be used for buildings and grounds, it could be used for books in the library, it could be for anything. It was completely open-ended. I think that he was hoping to set a trend in terms of, of uh, educational giving, the trouble was nobody ever took him up on it. So it was, but I think that this money, which lasted all the way into the, way into the 30s, may have helped the university get through the Great Depression. Um, his problem with endowments was that he felt that he was opposed to what he called perpetuities. Money that just sits there, lasting forever. And he had great examples of endow things, because his, he felt that people would put restrictions on this money, which would then be completely outdated. His favorite example of this was a man who gave a large chunk of money to, uh, found, to help people who were crossing the country by covered wagon. All right, that was fine, but what happened? <laughs> 
the railroad came along, right? So what happens to this money? It's sitting there. Nobody can use it. And so it's just sitting there. And it's completely useless. So this was his, he was afraid that, uh, and he believed that each generation should spend its own money for the things that it was interested in. And so that's why he really, he really opposed endowments. And he tried to get other people to go along with this idea, but uh, almost nobody was, was willing to take him up on it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I talk about his foundation. Um, OK. Finally, he, then he got involved in buildings. Um, in, uh, in one, he gave $250,000 for the building of a math building. And then he got a friend of his, whose name was B.F. Eckhart, to give an equally large sum of money. And the result was Eckhart Hall, because there already was a Rosenwald Hall. And he wouldn't have wanted the, money named, the building named after him anyway. So he was largely responsible for that. Actually, in terms of the capital campaign, he gave more money than anybody else. The capital campaign was a complete failure. It ended in September 1926, when all that was collected was $9.25 million. And of that sum, Rosenwald was responsible for bringing in $3 million between his own million, and he got two other people to also give a million. So he was largely responsible for the, whatever success the capital campaign had. In addition to giving the money for Eckhart, he was also asked if he would give money for the building of a men's dormitory on the other side of the midway. And <clears throat> he was, there were supposed to be both men's and women's dorms built. Um, and it took a little work. At first, he wasn't too enthusiastic about this. but. Later on, he, he got into it, and he agreed to pr pr give some of the money. The deal that was worked out in 1929 was that he would pay 40% of the cost of building what turned out, of course, to be BJ, Burton Judson, uh, if the university would put in 60% 60, 60 of the money. And so that was the deal that was worked out. And um, the result was um, he said that he would not go over $2 million dollars that turned out not to be necessary. He ended up spending some $685,000. Because of the Depression, the women's dorm that was supposed to be part of BJ never got built. So the women, unfortunately, got shortchanged. Finally, let me talk about the Hutchins proposal. This is one of the more interesting aspects. In 1929, Robert Maynard Hutchins became president of the University of Chicago, the youngest university president of a major research university in the country. And J.R. welcomed him and invited him to come out to his country home in Ravinia, uh, which interestingly enough was called Tel Aviv. And um, <clears throat> Hutchins came out and J.R. said to him, what would you do with $5 million? Well, you can imagine Hutchins' astonishment and he wrote back this long list of how important this would be. And he proposed several things that could be done with $5 million. But the one thing that really appealed to JR was the notion that things had kind of fallen off in the, in the university. There were a lot of professors whom Hutchins really wasn't enthusiastic about. And the $5 million could be used to, quote, get rid of dead wood and hire new faculty. And uh, Rosenwald thought this was a great idea. And so um, he, 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 this was the thing that he plumped for. Now, it shows his naivete, in a sense. Uh, he was a businessman. He didn't know about academic freedom or tenure. Uh, and so it was thought, he thought that this was great. Fortunately for Rosenwald and the university, the Depression intervened, and none of this money actually got expended. So that, I think, is probably just as well. So that sort of concludes Rosenwald's association with the university. But before I end, I want to talk about a few other things which his philanthropy was involved with. Uh, and then we can have questions. Um, and Elizabeth mentioned, me mentioned them. One is the schools. Um, in 1910, 
He read two books that changed his life. One was Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery, and the other was a book about a book by a um, white railroad magnate, also named Baldwin, who was president of the, of the Southern Railway and had been on the board of Tuskegee and was uh, the president of the board of one of the earliest foundations in America, the General Education Board, which was funded with Rockefeller money to assist the education of both blacks and whites in the South. Rosenwald read these two biographies at the same time and sort of discovered African Americans. Uh, they ex were only about 3% of Chicago was African American, and he felt that this, he was really interested in them. And so shortly after he finished these books, um, he was visited by a delegation from the YMCA, which asked if he would be willing to put, give $25,000 to give, build a black Y in Chicago. There was a desperate need for this because there were no hotels in the black community, and if you were a, an African American coming to Chicago to look for work, uh, and you didn't have friends or family already living here, where were you going to stay? You couldn't stay in a white hotel, and there were no black hotels. So the YM, YMCAs, which were sort of like dorms, in addition to being athletic facilities, uh, really were needed in the black community. Rosenwald replied that he would give $25,000 to any YMC, YM or YWCA in America that could raise an additional $75,000 to build a black YMCA or YWCA. So as a result of this challenge grant, 27 YM and YWCAs were built for African Americans all across America. As a result of this initial grant, he got to meet Booker T. Washington. And Washington asked if he would come on the board of Tuskegee, which he ultimately agreed to do. And with Washington, he, in, in part of that birthday gift in 1912 was to Tuskegee, $25,000 to establish a fund to assist black private schools in the South. They existed, but they had considerable problems because their boards were uncertain and they, faced, they were constantly facing challenges. So this money was to create a fund to be distributed by Booker T. Washington for assisting these schools in anything they wanted, whether it was in fundraising or accounting or to put a new roof on a building that had been destroyed by a tornado or whatever. But Washington had another agenda. He wanted to build black public schools. And so he asked if one-tenth of this money, $2,500, could, could be used to build six public schools in the vicinity of Tuskegee. And Rosenwald agreed. And out of this came a program whereby 5,357 schools, shops, and teachers' homes were built in 15 southern states. Now, this program was, was a public-private partnership because Rosenwald only put in between one quarter and one third of the money. Half of the money came from state and local government, and African Americans were supposed to pay an equal amount uh, or put in, they put in actually more money into this program than Rosenwald did. So, and 10% of the money actually came from local whites which is amazing when you consider that this was in the Jim Crow era when lynchings were going on. But there were some enlightened white farmers who realized that if they were going to prevent black sharecroppers from leaving their land and going north to seek jobs in northern cities, it might be a good idea to help educate their kids. And so these schools were born. And they, they lasted all the way up until the civil rights era. There were whole generations of African-American children who got their first shot at an education in a Rosenwald school. Finally, uh, the Museum of Science and Industry was an idea that he got in Munich in 1911 when he took his family there on a vacation. And he, his two youngest children were very bored. And so he promised them that he would spend doing whatever child wanted to do. And his youngest son, William, had only one thing he wanted to do, which was to go to a new museum that had opened in Munich called the Deutsches Museum, which was an interactive museum, and it was a prototype of the Museum of Science and Industry. So every time it was William's turn, they always went to the Deutsches Museum. And so Rosenwald got pretty familiar with it, and he thought that there ought to be something similar 
in the United States. But it wasn't until 1926, after he had retired from, uh, as president of Sears, that he suggested this to the Civic Club of Chicago. They thought it was a good idea, but it took a long time for this building to actually get uh, built as the Museum of Science and Industry. The one thing I want to, and Rosenwald died before it opened, but the one thing I want to tell you is that he, he, it was originally supposed to be called the Rosenwald Industrial Museum. And Rosenwald agreed to that for about five minutes. And then he realized that he didn't want this building named after him, that the people of Hyde Park had voted. He had pledged $3 million to put up this museum. But the people of Hyde Park had passed a bond issue for $5 million to restore this building, which was left over from the Columbian Exposition of 1893. And therefore, it, it wasn't, he hadn't put up the lion's share of the money, and therefore it shouldn't be named after him. There were also rumors that Field was having trouble getting money for his museum because people were saying, why should we give money to that museum if that wealthy Field uh, sponsored it? And he didn't want his family saddled with this museum. So he insisted that the name be changed uh, to the Museum of Science and Industry. I only want to talk about one more thing, and, that's about, and then I'll stop. That's about his foundation, which he established in 1917. He was on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation, and I think he thought that he could do a better job than Rockefeller. And so he established this foundation with a very broad mandate, and initially it mostly dealt with the schools because it was discovered that the schools weren't being well built, and he took it out of the hands of Tuskegee, which had been handling it, and put it in the hands of his foundation. He hired a man who was an expert in school building construction, and so that was what, things went along that way until 1927. And then he decided that he really wanted to reorganize this foundation. He was advised by his friend Flexner to hire somebody who was a professional in the foundation world. And so he hired someone away from the Rockefellers, a man named Edwin Embry. He gave the foundation $2 million more dollars, so it had an, uh, an assets of $20 million. And he did two other things which are really interesting. He, um, he decided that there should be term limits for trustees, something that had never been done before, and because he didn't like endowments, he insisted that this foundation had to go out of existence within 25 years of his death. It had to be spent down to nothing. This was the first major American foundation to sunset. Now it's become, he tried to get other people interested, but nobody was, and now it's become fashionable, and you might be interested to know that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has decided that it will go out of existence within 50 years of the death of the last trustee. So, I wonder where he got that idea from. <laughs> in any case, the foundation specialized in three things, which are interesting. Um, it stopped building schools, but it remained in the business of black education because they tried all kinds, they did things like pilot projects and busing. These schools were built in rural areas. And it was one thing for the white kids, they got bus to school, but the black kids had to walk sometimes five miles one way each day just to get to school. So busing was something that was really needed. Another thing was school libraries, and he found a, a, a librarian at Hampton in Virginia who drew up a list of suggested books that would be good for black children, and he agreed to pay part of the cost of putting these libraries in Rosenwald schools, and sometimes not in Rosenwald schools, but freestanding in communities in the South, but there was a proviso that the libraries had to be open to the children of both races. And <clears throat> finally, teacher training. He sent a group of people out to study what was being taught in the schools, and the answer was some of the teachers weren't very good, and so he put money into teacher education. The foundation also was interested in health care for the middle class and those classes below it, a problem that is still with us today. And you might be interested to know that out of a conference that took place in 1938, I think, uh, arose the beginnings of Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And finally, the foundation gave fellowships to African American writers, thinkers, painters, intellectuals. Um, these were not huge amounts of money. They were about $1,000. But can you imagine what $1,000 would have meant in 
to a, a young, struggling black writer or artist in the midst of the Depression. The maze of the people who got these fellowships uh, is really astounding. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Langston Hughes, um, John Hope Franklin, who got one to write his textbook, Zora Neale Hurston, who got one to study anthropology at Columbia, Ralph Ellison, who wrote The Invisible Man on a Rosenwald Fellowship, um, sculptors Augustus Savage, um, Gordon Parks, the photographer, Ralph Bunch, the diplomat, Jacob Lawrence, the artist, I could go on and on. In fact, if you're interested in this subject, there's an exhibit at Spurtis College, where I teach in downtown Chicago, of African-American artists who won Rosenwald Fellowships. And I urge you to see it, because it's really, really interesting. So I'm going to stop here, and I hope that you have questions. Thank you very much. I can't see very well, so I'm going to ask Patrick or somebody to, to help me out. Would you, would you? I've been to several Carnegie libraries, and they all have the same architectural feeling, whether or not they were the same architect. Were the schools similar in feeling, even if they were different architects? Well, actually, the school, they published a brochure, ultimately. Um, <clears throat> of several different plans that you could use. So they do all look somewhat similar. And one of the interesting things that I forgot to mention is that these schools are being rediscovered. They were, uh, but the National Trust for Historic Preservation put them on the most endangered list in 2002. And they're being discovered all over the South. And they're being refurbished and given a new lease on life as senior centers and community centers. And I actually, uh, just a few months ago, I went to one of the earliest schools built right near Tuskegee, which is being refurbished, and it's fantastic. It's being done by a group of eager architecture students from Auburn University, and this thing is amazing. So yes, uh, there were these plans, and they all have the same sort of feel to them. And part of the reason for that is that these schools were built in rural areas before TVA. So they lacked, these were not, exp these were not fancy looking buildings. They all have huge, they all face east-west, and they all have huge windows to take maximum advantage of sunlight. They, none of them had, they had no running water, so there were privies out in the back, but apparently there were separate privies built for boys and girls, which was considered an innovation in those days, at least for African Americans. And there was no central heating. There were stoves in each classroom. And part of the job of the kids was to go and collect wood in the winter to put in these stoves. So yes, there is a, a similar feel to all of these schools. Oh, uh, I wondered whether Rosenwald got in trouble, not in trouble, but in, had problems with the white community as a result of his support of the African-American community. You know, that's an interesting question. And there, not a lot. There was relatively little. You would think that there would have been more. There was some, some preacher in South Carolina who started preaching sermons against him. And then there was another preacher who took up the cause of, in his favor and wrote a book denouncing this uh, um, other preacher, which was called the Book of Ham. And um, so there really, uh, there was not. There was some, initially there was some, um, uh, some clamor from the Jewish community, unfortunately, which felt that he should be giving his money solely to Jewish causes and not messing around giving money to African Americans. And you may ask, why did he give money to African Americans? And one of the main reasons, there were two. One is that he felt that both Jews and blacks were being discriminated against in the America of his time. And therefore, according to the teachings of Rabbi Hirsch, it was incumbent upon him to assist his fellow man, his, uh, the African Americans, who were worse off than he was. And he felt that this was important. And another thing was that he felt that by building these YMCAs and schools, which were segregated because they had to be in that era, he was nevertheless trying to bring the two races closer together. Because if both blacks and whites were fundraising for these schools, here was something that was uniting them. 
And this was something that Booker T. Washington immediately realized. And one of the things that he did to keep Rosenwald's interest in the schools was to have both black and white members of the communities where the schools were being built write Rosenwald and say how grateful they were for these wonderful new school buildings. So, um, I mean, there are some blacks who have condemned Rosenwald because the schools were segregated and the wise. And the wise were mostly in northern cities. But the fact of the matter is, Rosenwald was a businessman and he wanted to get things done. And he knew that the only way to get them done was if these places were segregated. He was not in favor of segregation. The longer he lived, the more he worked to try and end it. But he was trying to work within the realm of the possible in that, in that day. Yeah. Um, you, you speak to the influence that his rabbi had over him, was, and maybe his wife, hard to say. She might have been his excuse to stall. But um, where did this incredible character come from other than that? Did, did he, do you know anything about his parents? Or? No, well, he, he was very much devoted to his mother. His father, I don't think he liked very much, um, as far, from what I can tell. His father was a difficult man. But he was absolutely devoted to his mother. Um, and she was probably, a, I don't think she was terribly well educated, but she was a very caring woman, uh, from what I can tell. And I think that, that, that may have had a, a fair amount to do with it. I'm, I'm no psychologist. Um, I, and I don't know. He was a very devoted family man. Um, and, and seemed to be a very caring individual, from what I could tell. Yeah. Uh, Peter, could you just say a few things about uh, the, uh, your personal experience of getting involved with your ancestor and, 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 <coughs> and a couple of, you just give us some? Sure. I guess I haven't said that he was, Julius Rosenwald was my grandfather. Maybe you did, I don't, you did. All right, well, in any case, um, it was a fascinating experience. It was really a sort of journey, a journey for, of discovery for me because my mother talked very little about him. Um, I knew certain stories. She used to tell me about how he would, he would sometimes walk her and her younger brother to the lab school and they would walk from their home in 4901 Ellis Avenue, which is still there, by the way, all the way to the lab school, that's quite a hike. Um, and a sh the chauffeur-driven car would be following closely behind so that when, not for security reasons, but simply so that when he was through delivering the kids, he could get in the car and be driven off to the Sears plant on Holman Avenue. Um, and I heard that and the story about how she went to her fir first and only Bible class um, at Sinai, which was taught by Rabbi Hirsch, who I guess wasn't very good with kids. And the story is that um, the, the story of the day had to do with stock as in cattle. And Rabbi Hirsch turned to my mother and he said in his bel thick Belgian accent, and what kind of stock is that? Is that shares of Sears Roebuck stock? And my mother turned crimson, rushed home, and announced that she was never going back there. And I don't think she ever did. Uh, so I heard those kinds of stories. But I really knew very little about them. And I knew something about Sears. I knew something about the Rosenwald schools. I had been to the Museum of Science and Industry as a child. But I didn't really know anything about this man. And all of a sudden, to discover, and I did a lot of research. It took me 13 years to research, write, and edit this book. Rosenwald's papers are here at the University of Chicago. But I didn't just stop there. My real coup consisted of going to my aunt's former home in New Orleans, which is now a sort of museum. It's well worth visiting, by the way. It's called, um, oh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's mostly gardens, though it isn't in the garden district. In any case, in the attic of this house, which is rel relatively nondescript 1920s mansion, um, in the attic of it, it turned out there was a whole series of boxes full of archival material, which nobody had ever really seriously gone through. There was no finding aid. There was nothing. So I just went through these papers, and I found some amazing things. And that was really, really, really interesting. I also went to the 
Hoover Library in Iowa, where the papers of um, Rosenwald's successor at Sears, General Wood, were kept. And Hoover's papers are there. I mean, he was involved in the Hoover campaign. Um, I went to Washington and looked up material on the War Industries Board, because he was involved in World War I. Uh, worked, he was one of those dollar-a-year men who worked for the government and was largely responsible for initially getting uh, supplies out to the soldiers in World War I, because the American Army wasn't prepared at all for something on the scale of World War I. Um, and he, you know, he had his experience at Sears. Um, so it, it's been an interesting, it was a fascinating experience getting to know this man, uh, and also trying to be fair. I mean, he was not, uh, he wasn't a goody two-shoes. He could be very difficult to work with. Um, and there were times when he was incredibly naive. In 1926, he got involved in a political campaign um, with a senator from Il who was running from, from Illinois. J.R. was a devoted Republican, because in those days, of course, that was the party of Lincoln and progressives, T.R., and so forth. Anyway, he was a senator, Republican senator from Illinois who had been t uh, named to the seat by the governor. It was clear that he was taking bribes from Samuel Insull, and so J.R. decided that this man had to go. And so he went to visit him, and since he took bribes, he offered him $500,000 worth of Sears stock if he would withdraw from the race. <laughs> and the man refused. Frank Smith was his name. He refused to do it. Um, but, and what happened to Frank Smith is exactly what J.R. predicted, is that he would be elected and the Senate would refuse to seat him. And that's exactly what happened. So he should have taken the money and run. But <laughs> it, was, uh, it was not a smart move. So I tried to be as objective as I could in this book and deal with J.R. warts and all. But I don't think there were all that many warts. I mean, this was truly an amazing man. Other questions? Ah. Does the philosophy of note and balance ever challenge? For example, when the school down in the South started to fall apart, it seems they did. Well, no. I mean, they fell. They the during his lifetime. Um, no. I mean, this was a deeply held belief of his. I'm sure that there were plenty of people who could have argued the other way, but this was something that he got more and more into. In fact, he published two articles: one in the Atlantic Monthly, which was sort of scholarly, and the other in the Saturday Evening Post. The one in the Atlantic was actually ghostwritten, but it did exemplify his ideas. And in these articles, which really, by the way, were the, after Carnegie and his Gospel of Wealth, were the only articles written by a real philanthropist about philanthropy. And he tried to get people to see the importance of getting rid of, of not having endowments. Um, but he just didn't have any takers, or very few. Let's put it that way. Other questions? All right. Thank 